Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Discover what's possible when people impacted by autism inspire change and build community. Together with the Global Autism Project, here's your host, Rachel Harmon. Hello, everyone. This week's episode is a recording of one of our Global Autism Community exclusive events. The topic of this roundtable discussion is safety in public. The diverse panelists include autism self-advocates Rachel Barcelona and Thomas Island, autism father and host of The Awesome Show, Jamil Owens, and our Global Autism Project partner from the Dominican Republic, Mari Carmen Hazuri. Other community members present at the event and part of the discussion are Jeff Snyder, David Sharif, Kia Burton, Karen Shapiro, and Ben Sharif. We hadn't originally planned to produce a podcast episode from this exclusive event, but we later thought it would be great to make this rich conversation available to our podcast listeners as well. We apologize for the inconsistent sound quality, but I assure you that the stories and perspectives shared by our guests are really worth listening to. In today's conversation, we discuss navigating around the community, autism disclosure ID cards, interactions with strangers and law enforcement, and setting boundaries on social media. In this episode, discover what's possible when awareness educates safety. To learn more about the panelists in this discussion, please visit our show notes at autismknowsnoborders.com. Roundtable discussions like the one you'll hear today are open exclusively for members of our online Global Autism community. We select a different theme each month, and our moderators monitor posts daily to ensure that our online space remains safe and respectful. If you'd like to attend and participate in any of our future events, you can sign up today at community.globalautismproject.org. Also, just a heads up that next week we won't be releasing a new episode in observance of Labor Day in the U.S. September is a good time of the year to reset and prioritize your own well-being and our team will be taking the week off to do just that. I encourage you to find a moment for self-care this weekend, whatever that means for you. For those of you living in the U.S., have a safe, happy, and restful holiday weekend. We'll be back on our regular release schedule on Thursday, September 16th. We appreciate your time. If you enjoy this podcast and you'd like to support our mission, Please take just a few seconds to share it with one person who you think will find value in it too. You can also follow us on Instagram at Autism Podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Global Autism Project, and join our community on Mighty Networks at community.globalautismproject.org. And now I present you the Global Autism Community. So let's actually go around and just introduce yourselves. Tom, you want to go first? Thank you. I'm Thomas Island, and I'm in Santa Clarita, California, just north of Los Angeles. I'm 37 years old, and I recently left my career as a certified public accountant in order to help people on the autism spectrum become their best selves. I do professional speaking. I'm a Toastmasters international accredited speaker. I'm a certified human potential coach, and I'm starting my own coaching business called come to life coaching. And I also do professional consulting for organizations with respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion. All right. Thanks, Tom. And Rachel. Okay. Hi, my name's Rachel. I'm an autism self-advocate and I just can't wait to talk here tonight. Thanks, Rachel. And Kaki. Hey, I live in Dominican Republic. I own a small ABA center and I'm a BCBA and I'm also a partner for with Global Autism Project. Right. And Jamil. And hey, everybody, how are you? (laughs) My name is Jamil Owens. I am a what I like to call awesome dad, hence the shirt where I'm wearing the awesome show, which I've created to help fathers with those children on the spectrum deal with their emotional connection, also their thoughts, their questions, a lot of feelings that they might have when getting that initial diagnosis. 
I am ecstatic to be here as I'm following sort of Tom's footsteps where I just quit my employment to focus full time on this and also my nonprofit. So I'm thankful to be here. Let's chop it up. Let's get down to these topics, you know. All right. Thanks, Jamil. And Karen, you are a new member. Is that correct? Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, yes, I am a new member. I'm Karen Shapiro. I am the mom of an autistic son. I guess I should say David Sharif is my son. And I'm a film producer and I'm producing a documentary at the moment. We're in development on the transition into adulthood for people on the autism spectrum. Very cool. All right, and David. Hi, I am David Sharif. I am one of the moderators for the Global Autism Project. I am an autism self-advocate and motivational speaker. Earlier in March, I published my first book titled The Empowerment of My Condition, Accessible in Global Bookstores, and I will type it in the chat right now. Thanks, David. And Jeff? Hello, my name is Jeff Snyder. I am an autism and neurodiversity self-advocate. I am based in Seekonk, Massachusetts, which is near Providence, Rhode Island. In uh, this past summer, I contributed to a book and Rachel Barcelona also contributed to a book called This is Autism by Jessica Lightwise and Aiden Allman Cooper. It is currently on amazon.com for 1997. Most recently also, I launched my own website on WordPress com and I will um, put it in the chat wall during tonight's meeting. Thanks, Jeff. Kia. Hey guys, my name is Kia. I'm a BCBA. I have been in the field for about 10 years now. I'm a part of the Global Autism Project team and I am one of your moderators on the community page. So um, you'll often see me and David and Jeff posing questions and polls and getting that engagement going in the community. So I'm really excited about this event. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about. And yeah, I, I look forward to hearing everybody's perspectives and that's like listening and learning from each other. All right. And Ben. Hi, I'm Ben Sharif. I'm David Sharif's older brother and Karen's firstborn son. I, I'm eager to learn from various self-advocates about neurodiversity and about their experiences. I think that's essential for, for everyone. So uh, grateful to be here and thank you all for taking the opportunity to do this. Uh, feel grateful to be here. Thanks, Ben. And I'm Rachel. I'm also a Global Autism Project team member and host of our podcast, Autism Knows No Borders. So, so happy to see everyone here on one screen. It is kind of like a reunion, as Jamil was saying. All right. So our first topic is going to be navigating around the community. So this has been a popular topic in the community already. And we want to talk about what kinds of tools you use to navigate yourself when you're geographically lost? And also, Khaki, for example, what are some ways that you teach this skill to your students and Jamil to your son? So actually, Rachel, would you want to start on this one? I don't know. I usually don't get lost. That's why. I usually help other people when they're lost. Okay. Was there something that you learned, like a skill that has helped you to not get lost? I just look at my surroundings and hope for the best. But I'm really good at analyzing things because I can just look at something and I know where I'm going, like reading the street signs. That's very good for me. Mm hmm. It's great. Tom, how about you? So I actually have some experience from being in the Boy Scouts of looking around my environment and figuring out where I am in time and space. So for instance, like the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So if it's close to like where I know the ocean is, I know that that's where west is. So I would head that direction if we're talking north, south, east, west. I also 
if anybody remembers Thomas guides, those map books where you look up a street and be able to pinpoint the grid where you were, I actually use those in a nonprofit that I belong to called safe rides where I drive people who are drinking and wanted to get home safely before we had Uber and Lyft. So I know how to read a Thomas guide and GPS has definitely been a huge savior, if you will, for, for me in finding where I am. And if you notice when you, it shows like the blue circle or where you are on a map, it also shows the direction that you're facing. So you can move the phone around and if the blue shade is going towards where you want to go, you'll want to know to go in that direction. So those are some of my tools or secrets to getting unlost. Mm -hmm. Jamil, what are some strategies that you teach Shane? Oh, as I get older, it seems as though getting lost is, is more fundamentally correct in these, these days, these ages. Shane has a remarkable sense of remembering exact exits, the amount of time driven on the road, landmarks, and also names of towns and places. So we never get lost at all. He's 13 now. He's been like this since uh, the age of eight where he's just looking out the window, observing his surroundings, just like Rachel says. But what we're working on right now, not to speed forward from the question, is actually taking train rides, which is his favorite thing, doing regional rail train rides to various stations. And what I'm trying to do is basically teach him, for one, how to pay attention to where exactly he's at while enjoying himself on the train and what happens if he misses his stop. Unfortunately, many of you may have heard, may have not have heard of um, fellow autistics like my son who have missed a stop and tragically, unfortunately, have been injured or killed because they are frantic and anxious to get off and correct this mistake. So, you know, I'm blessed as far as Shane knowing geographic areas. It's now putting the process, you know, the puzzles, the pieces to the puzzle together to just let him know, you know, just pay attention, observe your surroundings, but also relax and enjoy yourself. And it's something that he loves to do. So we have another train ride that he's planning right now. So I can't wait to be surprised when we have to go to the train station and we figure out where we're going. Kaki, how about in the DR? Do you have public transportation over there? How do people get around? Yeah, we do. Um, we haven't worked with any of our kiddos with public transportation. It's usually something we avoid exposing our kids to. Most of our kids will go with someone wherever they are going. Most of our kids ha are being accompanied by an adult when they do go out. What we teach a lot is basic skills to avoid them getting lost. So learning that when you're in a new place, stay near your adults. We work with a lot of little kiddos and then like older kids that haven't reached that level where they can go out on the community on their own. And then we also teach um, some safety skills when they do get lost, figuring out, I don't know where I am, I can't find my adults. And then being able to identify someone that might be able to take them to their adults. One of the first things we teach our kids is to care if they can respond to questions verbally to respond to basic personal information questions, what, what their name is, where their parents' names are, their parents' phone numbers. If they're using a talker, we use the talker. Or if they they might have a hard time speaking with, we'll use like an identity card that they can just pull out in case they find themselves lost. But one of the things that we also teach because it is a big safety issue is, well, we don't teach it, but we recommend it. It's the first thing we recommend to all our parents is swimming lessons. All our kids, that's like my number one recommendation. We're like, you need to go see a psychiatrist and get some of the, those like medical um, checkups, but you also need to get some swimming lessons. We recommend it number one, because there are so many accidents and we do live on an island, there's water everywhere. So it is a big risk here in DR. Interesting, yeah. And so you mentioned something about ID cards. And this has also been a topic that has come up in the community the past couple of weeks. What are your guys' thoughts on holding ID cards that disclose autism? If I could start on that, yep. because my mother and I train police officers about 
the signs of autism and what to look for and how to approach this population. And we're also teaching people on the spectrum how to safely disclose their diagnosis to officers because the more information officers and first responders have, the better they can do their job. And Jamil's nodding along with that, he can attest to it. But basically we need a safe way for people to disclose that information. And a little story I like to tell, when I got pulled over for the first time, I thought to myself, oh, that officer wants to see my ID and my self-disclosure card. And I start to reach for it into my pocket. And an officer might think I'm going for a gun or a weapon. And thank goodness the officer didn't pull his gun on me. Otherwise, I might not be talking to you right now. But basically, we need to be showing young people how to safely get their information to officers. And I actually have, so let's say an officer asks for your ID. Then you can go get it safely. So wait for someone to ask for your ID and then produce it along with a card like this. I'll put a website in the chat here, but basically this is what people need to know, first responders, rescuers, about the signs of autism, emergency contact information, and how to help the person. Mm -hmm. and, and you can check off accommodations so that the person who's questioning you or helping you can help you best. So this is helpful, but dangerous if not taught how to produce safely. Yes, exactly. So I want to piggyback what Tom said. First off, the cards are amazing. I actually have received cards from him and his mother, and I do send them out to any of my guests or audience members who listen in or attend one of the interviews that I do on my platform. So I'm 100% behind the cards. What I will also like to interject is that the teachings is not only on law enforcement, but also on the parents. So we have to educate both sides in order to make sure that the formula is equally yoked, we can say. I'm ex-corrections. I was a corrections officer in the state of Delaware. So there are certain things that Tom actually mentioned that even we get taught that are similar to police departments. I am now a volunteer firefighter. So there's a lot of things that I have experienced in my span of a public service, which ID cards, lanyards, Whatever the case may be, will be very helpful for first responders. It is something that is needed. But what is also needed is, once again, for the teaching of the parent, hey, when an officer pulls you over, you want to ask him or her, can you reach before you reach? Because just like Tom said, that can be a disastrous thing, and we know what happens to disasters. They end up on the news. We get one side of the story. Now we're pointing fingers, and the whole community is rattled over that. So... I definitely do agree with that, but I agree that both sides have to be taught this lesson. And it starts with advocates like us, self-advocates, mothers, fathers, therapists, whoever you may be, actually getting out there and putting themselves forward and saying, hey, I would love to teach you as a department, or I would like to speak to maybe your chief or have a little town hall meeting and then speak to the parents also in that town hall meeting so questions can actually be answered in, in a fun, organized way. Why I say fun is because this is our village. This is our community, deep are our children. We have to raise them together. So uh, that's just my aspect on it. Kaki, do you teach any police interaction programs in the DR? Not really, and it's not something that I've thought about teaching here. Police, like, it's weird to say because in the States, you like, you hear all the news and, well, I hear all the news, and it's terrifying. Here, it's a little bit more unpredictable what you will encounter with a policeman. You can, like, your interactions can be completely positive or it can be completely unexpected. It's just, I wouldn't even know where to start when we were would teach those skills because there's so, so much inconsistency between the police officers that we encounter. What we mostly teach is avoiding getting into those situations. I don't even know how I, I just start crying. And because I'm a girl that usually works, but like, I don't even, I don't even know how I, what it would teach my kids to do in those situations. Mm -hmm. Well, Jamil, what are some things that you teach Shane? The first thing I teach, obviously, is not to be afraid. He's already had this sense of, oh, no, we have to stop. We have to get out the way, which is good. 
because, you know, it's emergency situation. Those officers or first responders are trying to get to an emergency, but also too, in a non-emergency situation, I'm teaching him to actually walk up, introduce himself and just ask questions, just talk to them like they're people. Cause at the end of the day, officers, EMTs, firefighters, whatever the case may be, they're just regular people. And our children, our awesome children have to understand that, you know, that we're teaching them to build relationships out of love, out of compassion. And that goes all across the board, wherever you're at. So why not these officers? You know, they're not just robots here to protect people. And then they go into this little box to recharge. They're people who go through struggles every single day. I think it's really, really bad right now, obviously, with everything that's going on, that that connection is severely severed. And it is very hard to get that connection back together. But once again, it takes a village. It, it takes both sides to actually come together. So, you know, when I'm he's over my house and I'll go over to the firehouse and, and introduce him to all the guys and and let him see the equipment and, and just let him get a rapport about, hey, my dad's a firefighter. You know, these guys are also my family, a brotherhood. And, you know, fellow police officers in the neighborhood, I, I let him know, hey, wave at the officer. If the officer waves at you or asks a question, be, you know, be respectful and, and just talk to him just like he's a regular person. But Shane has a personality. Well, he will talk to you like no other. And I love it. I don't stop it. I love it. And um, I think that's just something that we can just grow off of as individual people of these amazing autistics in society, just to be open and be transparent with people. So I just sit back and let him do his thing, but I direct, uh, redirect as necessary and just make sure he focuses, you know, on just being transparent with these, these first responders also. Yeah. Rachel, do you carry a disclosure card that says you have autism? No, because I don't, think I should have to I think that it's like it's exploitation and it's sort of treating us like we're pieces of meat and we're problems and I think that we should move beyond that what do you think would be helpful for police officers to know about autistic people well, we definitely need to put more effort into training the officers to help handle us and actually having them care about training us. I remember one of my friends who's a police officer and he is very, very committed to helping us. And he was talking to his fellow police officers and they were just like, why do we have to care about this? Hmm. So that is a very essential need that not only the, the law enforcement has to do, but we have to help educate them as well. Got it. Tom, what are some specific things that you include in your training to LAPD? Well, first, we identify uh, some of the examples, real life examples in the media of where autism has played a part. So, for instance, there was a Last year, around this time, a young man in Utah on the autism spectrum also had some mental health issues, uh, got shot multiple times. He did survive, but the police response wasn't that good. And even here in Los Angeles recently, another person with autism, and I think he's deaf as well, had a, a mental health encounter, also got shot, and now he could be paralyzed for the rest of his life. He's still alive, but hanging by a thread. And yes, autism is something that needs to be trained and educated on with our police officers. And that's why I have those trainings and I identify what to look for and how to interact with this population. But I also remind the officers that just training the police is not enough. My mother and I have found that young people, families, educators need to be involved in the picture as well because officers cannot be expected to be experts on everything. And yet that's what society seems to want or expect. So it has to be a two-way street, give and take, so both parties receive that training, that education, that understanding and awareness, and even opportunities to bridge the gaps between the two parties. So that's why my mother and I do what we do, putting on events that unite the two communities, police and autism. But I always remember to remind people, uh, police officers, I should say, that 
people on the spectrum are just that people, human beings. And if you have someone who has a disability or a condition, what have you in your family, how would you want them treated by first responders or people out in the public? Uh So that's why we need to be respectful while also mindful of what they're going through and that they may not know their rights, for example, and giving them the benefit of the doubt. So that way, if they say or do something that could technically cause them to be arrested or go to jail, that that might scar them emotionally and personally for the rest of their lives. Yeah, especially I'm thinking about in those moments when police officers enter a situation and they're trying to de-escalate and make sure that everyone is safe, including themselves as officers, but without understanding that maybe someone is going through a so-called meltdown and not trying to be aggressive, but is just trying to cope with what's happening because they're overwhelmed or overstimulated, that not to react in those situations. It's really hard though, because I understand from the police officer's perspective, if they don't know that that person has autism, they don't know what the signs are, how can they really differentiate in a split second? You're right. And I train the mental evaluation unit officers of LAPD, and they have a series of de-escalation techniques and tactics they use for conditions besides autism. Some of them work for the autism population, some of them don't. But when all is said and done, if we people on the spectrum don't say that we are on the spectrum, the officer might very well think that we are high on drugs, that we are drunk on alcohol, that we are mentally ill. And autism is not drunk, high, or mentally ill. And I understand you don't want to be seen as a piece of meat or as a problem. But if you don't say that this is a condition I have and how it impacts you, then be prepared to be misinterpreted as drunk, high, or mentally ill. So here's a here's another thing. As you guys was talking, I just did a, a national conference with Milestones uh, speaking about this with uh, Ben Hartraff, who is the creator and host of the Ben and Jay show. I'm his co-host. So I did some chicken scratch. Maybe you can see. (laughs) So this triangle here is called the uh, continuum force pyramid. So it's taught to every law enforcement officer, corrections, whatever it may be. It's the pyramid. It's taught the top being deadly force, impact weapons being underneath, hands being underneath that. And a very low bottom of that pyramid is verbal commands. So I pose the question out to the audience is, okay, do we need to reconfigure this pyramid to include those with special needs? All across the board, and I'm not talking about just autism, I'm talking about all across the board, because my time in in working in the prison system, I've seen everybody in there with every type of disability that you can imagine in prison. So do we need to include some type of different formula into that? I want everybody to think about that. You know, you can form your own questions, but it's a very important question. On top of that, we get a call from the operator. Hey, uh, caller reports a fire. Got to go. We're in a truck. We're lights blaring. We're going down the road. We are being told that there is a fire inside of a building. When we pull up, there is no fire inside the building. The fire is next to the building. So you see where I'm going with this is that we're getting different information from the call operator to the officer. Now, it's nobody's fault. And I'm sure you can remember this exercise where you'll say one phrase into a person's ear and they go around a circle. And by the time it gets back to you, it's all jacked up. Well, that's where there's a disconnect at. We need to get our parents a little bit more friendlier, a little bit more communicable with the law enforcement community, which means that, hey, I need you for you guys to understand that my child is on the spectrum. Is there some type of marker we can put in the system? Tom, I'm sure you you heard of this. They're coming out with uh, ID cards that actually label you as having a intellectual disability. Now, Rachel, I get what you're saying because That's just another label we're putting on our children out here. So why would I want to do that? Because it's going to eliminate that miscommunication that happens every single day. I see it. It costs lives. 
or it stalls in any type of additional support or mediation, whatever the case, case may be. I think that's where we need to go to. And it's going to take a revamp of starting with the continuum force pyramid. That's my belief. It's going to have to start there because once we actually split that pyramid down and include something for those with intellectual disabilities, I think we can arm our officers and first responders with a lot of different tools and a lot of different training. Great points, Jamil. I will take a pause and open it up to the audience for any questions or comments so far. David? Jeff Snyder and I communicated via direct message, and we agreed on this question. Jeff, I'm going to read it out loud if you don't mind. Go ahead. He and I said, we want to ask, what do you do when interacting with firefighters, especially if it comes to fire drills at school, which are really loud? for emergency purposes, how has your child or you yourself coped with the fire alarm as it happened, or if you were close to a spot where something was on fire and you had to get away with it? I'll break the ice on this one by saying it's been about 20 years since I was last in high school and experienced something equivalent to a fire drill, but I reckon in places of employment, this could happen as well. And as I look back on my years in high school, I actually went to a school where there were young people who actually, I think they got a little bit of a high or a pleasure in pulling the fire alarm just to hear the light, the lights and see the strobes and the <laughs> alarm sound. So at this school, I think we went through about three or four fire drills a day at one point, and that wasn't very good at all. So while it might seem like fun or like that person gets a high out of it, it's self-destructive and boundaries and the appropriate interventions have to be put into place so that someone doesn't do what they shouldn't do and cause trouble for themselves and everybody else. Because uh, if they do that when they're adults, that could be considered a crime and they'll get prosecuted for false pulling of a fire alarm. Mm -hmm. I can't really, uh, it's been, a, I think it's probably been longer for me, Tom, uh, since I had a fire alarm. And it's ironic enough that now I put out fires. And, um, you know, by the time we get there, we normally have the bystanders outside. If the unfortunate circumstance where there are people on the inside, it's kind of hard to give my perspective to that question. But what I will quote on is just the absence of a rescue plan for those individuals that may be on an autism spectrum or other disabilities. Once again, I think that, you know, school systems have a very good plan in place, but they often forget those individuals that may need a little bit more assistance getting out. So that can cause for, you know, first responders such as myself to have to go in there and look for them. And you're talking about an individual who may be very sensitive to light and to sound, where will they go? If I didn't have a child on the spectrum, I, in the back of my mind, wouldn't know, hey, I need to look in the bathroom. Or if it's a household, I need to look in the tub. Or you know what, do they have a crawl space? That's a favorite spot, a hiding spot, a, a secret place that they might hide in. If I didn't have a child on the spectrum, I wouldn't be educated on these things. So once again, I just think it just needs to be something that needs to be worked on as far as uh, first responders and law enforcement as well. Kaki, Rachel, do you have anything to add to that? It is something that we've I've worked on before with some kiddos back when I lived in the States and worked at a school that did fire drills. We don't have access to that system. Them, so we can't really do fire drills at the center. But most of our kids right now tend to try to get away from the sound and the bright lights. And usually that means leaving the building. So it hasn't come up as an issue because they're the first ones out. They're the ones that like, they're like, oh, it's time to get out. I'm 100% getting out of here. Like there is no reason I'm staying here. But one of the things that I know 
can work with some of our older kiddos who can have a little bit more language skills is just like explaining it, like being like, this is a safety issue, explaining what can happen, using social stories, repeating it, doing different versions of the story, like doing TV shows and stuff like that. And just like modeling it over and over again, practicing it with like lower sounds and not so bright lights, and then slowly working them up to it. And it has worked, but there are always kids who it's just so hard for them when it's so loud and it's so bright that you do need to have that like contingency plan. Like if this does happen, how are we going to help you get out of here? Because it is a safety issue and we do need to practice even that in those moments. Mm -hmm. Rachel, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I know that I always hated fire drills because they were really loud and it's hard to remember because it was so long ago how I would deal with them, but I know I had a lot of music therapy and I'd listen to loud music for hours, preferably opera tapes, and that helped me just deal with it and it also helped me realize I love to sing. Nice. Yeah. All right. Were there any more questions or comments from the audience on the topic of police interactions or navigating around the community? What to do if you're lost? Anything else before we move on? Kia. Yeah, I kind of want to circle back around to the discussion about the ID card and the the label of either, you know, autism or, you know, is autistic on the ID card. Rachel, I'd love to hear more of your perspective. Um, I posed this question in the community last week and I got a lot of good feedback where it should be the individual's choice. So in this forum here, I I do see that there are some differences in, you know, the choice to have it on there. So Rachel, I would love to hear more of your experience if you have any with the police officer there a certain way that you communicate with them or have you even been in that experience where you've had to verbalize that so they can better understand whatever situation you've been in? Yes, I actually have had experiences where police officers didn't really care that I was autistic and they didn't want to understand. Like I was having a meltdown and then this officer was just yelling at me and I, of course, didn't have a card, but I stood up for myself. And that's just what I do. If you come after me, I'm going to come after you. But What I think, and people also think that I'm high all the time as well due to being autistic because I have a slower voice, but I just tell them, yeah, okay. (laughs) I, I don't know. I'm just totally numb to it. I don't care what people think. I think it should be an individual's choice to have a card. I wouldn't want one because I personally think I am more than my disability and it would be embarrassing. I can fend for myself when a police man or woman is being rude to me and it's happened and I will make sure it won't happen again. Okay, yeah, thank you for sharing. I was just, I was very curious and I also believe that it should be an individual choice. And there was a comment that was made about whatever the individual is most comfortable with and what makes them feel safe. And I'm glad that, you know, you feel comfortable and confident and safe enough to be able to vocalize it in those situations. So thank you for expanding on your thoughts with that. And if I may weigh in, I'm not a parent, but I know there are parents on this call. And then my mother and I have spoken to several over the years and we are leaving safety to chance. We think The kids know what to do. We think the officers will be understanding. We think there'll be a caregiver to explain the situation. That's all a risk. And I don't know about you, but we're talking about life and death here. One wrong word, one wrong move, and you could be gone. I don't mean to be so chaotic or worst case scenario, but sadly, this is the reality that we live in. If you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. That's all I have to say. I think it also has to do with what Kia said about feeling safe, because I wish I had a card that said, like, I'm terrified of police every time a police stop me because I am terrified of, like, what could potentially happen. But 
if you have those skills and you are able to self-advocate during those moments, maybe that's your card. That's your way of protecting yourself. And I think the unpredictability of what could possibly happen when you encounter a police officer or a police, I don't know, like I, it's different levels, I guess, wherever you live. I still don't know what skills you really need and able to, to be able to manage these things because I feel like we're at a very big disadvantage with the current situation that we're living. In. So even when we say like, you need to prepare and it's true, I wish I could prepare but I, sometimes I just, I don't know how to prepare for these situations. I read the stories in the news and even when people do the right things that we've been taught to do, things can go wrong. And you see also stories where people are acting up and not doing what they're supposed to do and everything goes by smoothly. So I think it's too unpredictable to be truly prepared. But in the end, if you can advocate for yourself verbally, then that is a skill you have and that's something that you can use. And that's going to work in a situation where the police officer is going to handle it as expected. But I don't think that a card or any skill is going to really help you in a situation where the police officer isn't trained or prepared to handle the situation. And I think that's where there's that big scariness of it all. Like, until we don't, like everybody isn't on the same page of what to do in those situations, we won't be able to prepare and they won't be able to manage any situations with people on the spectrum or even just like people who are terrified of police officers and get tongue-tied when they're stopped at a red light. Yeah, great points. Yeah, I love that. And I think that that's why these discussions are so important to be able to hear from multiple perspectives because you never just want to assume that everybody with autism wants to have this on their card or all police police officers are going to understand this because two of them that you know do, right? So I think now we, we definitely live in a world where there is so much, I guess, tension, not just with individual autism, but just, you know, in, in general, racially as well. So these type of conversations are important to be able to be open about it so that you can listen to each other and learn from it and not just make a general assumption to speak for an entire you know, population. Yes, exactly. Okay, I'd like to move on to now talking about interactions with strangers in general. And I wanna start actually by specifically talking about the higher risk of autistic women being taken advantage of. You know, this is kind of the unfortunate truth of the reality that we live in right now. So what are some strategies that have helped you when interacting with strangers and determining if the situation is safe? Rachel, do you wanna start on this one? Yeah, I mean, I'm really paranoid, so I don't talk to that many people that I think are strange anyway, so <laughs> that helps. But I just think, read their body language or what they're saying. If you don't like it, just leave. That's what I always say. Kaki, do you have anything to add? Have you taught any of these programs at your center in ACAP? So what we work on mostly, because we have a, a lot of issues with our kids, because when since they're little, they are being either physically prompted or they have so many staff members around them, uh, like a therapist quit today. And so you get a brand new therapist who's playing with you like she's known you for years. So they get used to this kind of interaction. So when you're older, you're like, oh, like you're just used to a stranger coming up to you and physically moving your body when that's definitely not OK. So some of the things that we do is try to teach our kids from very, very young age that you need to get to know someone before you hug them or before they try to like move your body for you or before they go with you to the bathroom because you need help in the bathroom. We try to make sure that when we're teaching toilet training, we keep the door closed, even if they're little kids. And even if 
there's another student that the staff member is supposed to be with. You call another staff member to stay with that student and you, if the staff member has to come into the bathroom with you and close the door because you need help in the bathroom, then we do that. But that helps the kids understand their privacy and that their bodies are private and that not everybody can see you when you're in the bathroom and not everybody can see you when you're naked. And then we talk about those things. We talk about where you can be naked and who's allowed to see you naked and who's allowed to ask you to take your clothes off. That's only your parents and your doctor when you're at the doctors with your parents. So it's about teaching those like discriminations of when these situations are okay. And then teaching our kids when like how to communicate when they happen and it's not okay. It's a lot of work that I feel gets forgotten. So it's, it's things that we need to tell our parents too. We're like, make sure that when he's getting dressed at home, you close the door because we need to teach him. Like, it's your body. You need it's You have to have privacy, and your privacy is important too. And sometimes we forget because maybe our kids need a little bit more help, or maybe it's a busy day and we just leave the door open and they don't really seem to mind. But we need to teach those skills so that in the moment where they find themselves in those situations, then they can know it's not okay and they can do something about it. Yes, great. Tom, do you have anything to add about maybe what your parents taught you when you were growing up? Well, one thing that my parents taught me is about what's called the circle of friends. So picture the people in your life as like a, an archery target. You've got yourself as the bullseye, then one circle out are your closest friends or people you see on a daily basis, your family, people you have a close relationship with. One more circle out, you've got people you see often maybe in class or you might hang out with them at recess or outside of school every now and then. One more layer out, you've got people you see out in the community, like maybe your grocery store clerk or someone at the dry cleaners or people you see with like for business related purposes. The very last and biggest circle layer out there are strangers, people you do not know, people your parents don't know, and people you probably shouldn't be talking to unless your parents are with you or something like that. So by identifying who's in which circle is a good way to identify and teach what you can and cannot do with those particular individuals. And when it comes to touching, and this is a concept that's taught in Be Safe, the movie, about pretend having a hula hoop around you. And no one comes into your hula hoop unless you say they can and vice versa. You do not go into another person's hula hoop unless that person says you may come in. So these concepts, these abstract concepts have to be directly and explicitly and privately taught rather than being left to chance or, and particularly with, I, I hate to keep going back to police officers, but they need double the space, like twice the hula hoop space because they've got the equipment that shouldn't be touched. And let's face it, when people on the spectrum touch in ways they shouldn't or attempt to touch in ways they shouldn't, then they get in trouble. Yeah, that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Like teaching explicitly, not just to protect yourself, but what other people's boundaries are, which may not seem to come naturally all the time, even if they're not intending harm. So Rachel, it's, uh, I'm not going to say crazy, but it's ironic that we talk about this because now my son is a teenager. So now he is wondering about his body and different changes that are going on. So this is a talk that I have with him frequently because it's like an hour drive between my home and his mother's home. And it starts early on, you know, give them that privacy when they go into the bathroom like it was explained earlier, you know, shutting the door, giving them that space to be able to handle the situation. It's confidence in them. But unfortunately, we live in a society that is wrong in so many areas. And, and this is one of the areas, one of the scariest areas. So that's a very good question because, you know, I can't even sit there and say, I know it all. How do I teach my son what is right and what is wrong as far as personal touch. It's funny because most of the children uh, are awesome children. They are very keen to when someone is quote unquote off, they won't hug them. They won't be around them. They'd be like, no, no, no. They'll stay next to mommy and daddy. And it's got to kind of like ring something in your head. Like, 
okay, my, my son and daughter don't act like this around a lot of people, what's going on? But as they get older, they get a little bit more gullible. You know, they think everybody is, is on their side or everybody is happy. And um, that might not be the situation. So as a parent, it is scary. And, and that's one of the things where I'm, I'm looking to learn more. How do I teach my son about the personal space and what's good, acceptable as far as touching and what he should do as far as touching also, because obviously he's starting to like girls. So he has to learn how to interact with females, but also give them their space. So it's good that we're talking about this because that's something that I, I definitely need a manual on to take notes as well. So I can uh, educate him a little bit more, but yeah, it's a scary situation as a parent. Yeah. Well, do you start with, well, maybe not start with, but is one angle teaching consent? I, uh, I think Tom, I think you, I think you taught me this. Is this the tenant, the tennis uh, acronym that you used? Uh, for those of you that don't know it, the analogy to a conversation or a relationship or a friendship is like a tennis game. So it, it goes back and forth. I talk to you, you say something back to me. I go to you, you say something back to me. People on the spectrum will leave voicemail after voicemail, text after text, serve, 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 serve without any response. And then they're thought of as stalkers and are getting restraining orders filed against them. So we need to teach our young people that we need give and take. If no one's hitting that ball back to you, find another person to play with. There you go. Listen, if only we could probably uh, absorb some of that knowledge as well, there'll probably be less court cases <laughs> in the world, too. So uh, Tom was the one that actually taught me that because we interviewed him on the Ben and Jay show. And I actually spoke to Shane, my son Shane, about that. And he understood it. And I was like, OK. And it was like, all right, like the conversation was just like, Okay, I understand. And I was like, do you? And he was like, yeah, I understand. I was like, okay, I guess that worked. But it's just building every single day, learning new lessons, just teaching him and giving him examples too. It's just that. And it's both sides. You know, his mom and his mom's boyfriend and and here and my wife, you know, we're just all just really communicating and just on the same page as far as the betterment when it comes down to uh, my son, Shane. So it takes that, but I, I can imagine, you know, Rachel, just a lot for you, just really how to absorb that. I, I really want to get an individual like yourself. I really want to hear more in depth about your experiences and, and just how crazy it may be or how easy it might've been for you to kind of like, you know, control that situation, because it is harder for girls and for women that are on the spectrum, unfortunately. And I've ran into a lot of women that, you know, been diagnosed when they were like 50 or 60. And it's like, OK, well, you know, how how is that? What transpired in your life? So definitely something that I'm interested in hearing from Rachel a little bit more, too. Well, I can definitely relate to the whole tennis fall thing. And I, I've never heard that before because something happened to me recently. And it's like, I met this girl and we just been hitting it off really well. But I almost lost a really good person because she said I was talking to her too much. Like I would just be texting and texting because I just, I like her a lot. And I didn't know what I did. I just thought I was being friendly. I never thought I would be just that over texture and that happens a lot with a lot of autistic people so I guess that was kind of a wake-up call and it's it's kind of a good thing just keep going back and forth and read people's thoughts if they're not into it then you should stop talking to them Rachel what advice would you give you know going back to the stranger conversation, what advice would you give to other autistic women about staying safe and determining if a situation is safe? Well, I always carry mace with me whenever I go for a walk, because you never know who might be out there. And there's always a, a great way to determine if a situation is safe. Just read your surroundings. And that is, that's usually what I do. I mean, I'm 
not very good at it myself, but I try my hardest. Yep. All right. I'd like to pause here and open it up to the audience. David, do we have any questions from anyone about this topic? Not off the top of my head. I think our panelists just answered them explicitly nailed on the head. And I feel like we've covered a lot and a fair amount. But to move forward with questions, I am wondering if my mother or brother have questions that come to their minds. Nothing like being put on the spot. I am very intrigued by this conversation because I think it's a very tough one to teach and a very hard one, even if you're not neurodiverse and you're a woman out there. And so I think it's important. And also I think it's a hard one to teach one's children. How do you teach when there's so many different possibilities? So I'm very intrigued by the conversation and appreciate everything everyone has said. So thank you very much. Karen, was there something that worked for you when teaching your sons? I mean, I, I think it's what's commonly, you know, known to not talk to strangers, to watch your surroundings and make sure you're obvious about what's around you, to be very alert and focused when you're walking down the street. You know, I think of my sons who both, I live in Los Angeles, both of them live in New York. So they're in the subway at night and they're walking the streets. So I'm, I'm like, really pay attention to what's going on around you. And that's something interesting because I'm going to move to New York and my mom doesn't want me going on the subway at night. Yeah, so I understand that. Stupid, but I'm going to anyway, so. <laughs> well, just be, so my recommendation to you, Rachel, is to take the, to the subway car that ha is in the middle that is where the conductor is. So if you're gonna take a subway, go in the middle cars. And there's there are signs often, and David may even know more than me, about which where those middle cars are located so that you know you could always have a conductor there in the same car with you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Mom, I wanna add on to that point. You would only know which car the conductor is on when that conductor opens the window and looks out for the passengers. You may not be exactly in the middle, but you could be towards the middle. I've had my fair share of sitting in between cars or crossing cars when the train is not moving. So when I get around the community or when I want to stay below ground to avoid the heat or getting wet, sometimes I have to take the front or the back of the train. So that way I am directly towards the exit or wherever such and such. But you only get used to it when you know the surrounding that you're gonna be more familiar with than another one you will have limited time with. And I see here in the chat, Jeff, you made some comments about over-corresponding. And as you know, Rachel and Tom have mentioned that it is common among autistic people. I think this is a good segue into our next topic, social media interactions. And I know that, you know, it's even harder sometimes to read social cues online, especially if you can't see the person or hear their tone. So how do you set boundaries? And, you know, Rachel and Tom, you're both public figures on the social media world and have plenty of followers. So how have you navigated these situations? So I would say that as a rule of thumb, when it comes to like friends requests or people looking to follow you, look for mutual friends. 
if you don't recognize this person and there's no mutual friends, there's a chance that that person is not actually a person, but a bot or someone who's been paid to get information or even money from you. So that's a big red flag for me. If I don't see any mutual friends, I don't recognize the person or the name or the photo, thinking this can't be real and I would remove that request. If they follow up later, and then I might look at it a little bit further, but that is definitely one big rule of thumb or a red flag watching out for those bots and make sure there's some mutual friends. Another item with social media and uh, cyber bullying in particular is to watch out for those that are asking for very personal information. So if someone get one, says, I'll give you X amount of dollars or for a free gift card, enter this information. That's what's called phishing, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. They want your information so they can use it and take your money or even your identity from you. And those are very difficult to get back. Not that I've necessarily experienced that, but these trolls, these bots, these extortionists or exploiters are out there. So. And I'd like to add to that because I know on my social media, I get a lot of requests from people that are, they work with these influencer things and they ask you to model their clothes or promote their stuff. And they'll leave the little comments on your picture or whatever. But nevertheless, it all turns out to be a scam. There was this one that I actually looked into, but I never went through with it. And then not too long after that, it just was revealed that it was a scam and it was preying on these young people trying to make it online. And it just took their money. I don't want to say the name of it, but a lot of these things are like that. So yes, it's very important. Look for mutual friends. Check to see if it's credible if they're asking you to do something or promote something, but I check to see if you know someone first, because I also get a lot of requests from people I don't know. And while I'm, while it's on my mind, uh, watch out for people that say, I'll be your friend if, or click on this, then I'll be your friend or you'll get something. Cause that's not unconditional love and that's not a real friendship. So you shouldn't have to give something away for someone's friendship. I feel like that should be taught in school for everyone. Yeah, I, I talk about that whenever I give speeches to high school students or college students about what is a real friendship versus someone who's looking to use or even abuse you. Mm-hmm. Jamil, is Shane on social media now? Have you had to teach him how to set boundaries? Uh, Shane is not on social media unless he is on my platform. I did one episode where I interviewed Shane, just a couple of questions, um, but he's not on social media. He does enjoy YouTube. He has followed some, some enthusiasts who are on YouTube and I like to question them about who they are. You know, what do you like about them? Who are they? What do they produce? What do they talk about? So these are things to make sure he knows, because if he doesn't know too much and he's just like, oh, I just think they're cool. To me personally, as a parent, that just throws red flags because you don't know too much about them, which means that there was some type of interaction which they came up on your radar. So I need to investigate a little bit more on who they are as an individual. And so far, he's been good. I did catch him with some content that wasn't too bad, but it wasn't too good. And I talked to him about it and he's like, oh, delete. And I don't have to talk to him about it. So he's doing good. He's doing good. I think it circles back to what we were just talking about. The last topic is giving the space to make their own decisions. You know, at the end of the day, they are capable. Rachel, you're capable Tom, you're capable. So many autistics that I've met are capable of making their own decisions. And it's like, okay, as a parent, am I being overbearing? You know, am I being too much, too worried, which can hinder their growth? So, you know, when that day comes and it comes down for advocating for him too, when he steps to me and be like, hey, dad, you know what? 
I got it. I think I can speak for myself now. I think I'm good. Then uh, I'm going to just fall back. I'm going to just relax. You know, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing for the community, but I'm going to fall back as far as being a voice for him. And I think this is one of the things, too. If he wants to, you know, have a a social media account, I want to discuss it with him. What are you going to what are you planning to do? Is it personal? Is it business? You know, what what are you thinking about? And kind of like just pray about it and let him take the reins, you know, and hopefully during that time of now and when that comes about, hopefully I'll just guide him right in life. So he'll, he'll know, you know, what decisions to make. So that's all I can say about that. Cause social media is, whew, yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. And, and kids are going to get curious about things they see or hear on social media. And even if they don't have a Facebook or an Instagram or social media, a Google search because they heard this term out in public could res- open a whole can of worms. I know of a young man who heard about child pornography, Googled that, clicked on a link, it turned out to be part of a, like an FBI sting, and he was arrested. So that clickbait is out there, or we don't put, set the boundaries. And again, a very abstract concept that needs to be taught in order to keep our kids safe and out of criminal underworlds. All right, David, do we have any questions from the audience? I saw you posted something. Would you like to share that? Yes. So. This is social media significance. I did put out a question. I like the points that all of you guys gave on how to be mindful in interacting with others. Another thing to be aware of is be careful with what you post. It's not just you, but others, because whatever they post or what you post will get screenshotted right away despite you editing or removing it. So has there ever been a time where you posted something and then yet you had to edit it several times to make sure that it's phrased appropriately such and such, or did you just delete it because you knew that it was not going to provide any significant engagement? I mean... I do the social media for the center and I upload stuff all the time and it has typos or like it's written wrong or something. So yeah, I can definitely relate to that. Haven't done anything major yet, but still got time. When I was in college uh, going for my bachelor's in accounting, one of the things that one of my teachers taught me is to uh, not put anything on social media you wouldn't want on the front page of the Wall Street Journal a major newspaper or publication, or that you wouldn't want your grandmother or other trusted relatives who thinks you're such a nice person to see and think differently of you. So be mindful of where your post might appear, picture it if it appeared somewhere that you wouldn't want it to be. I think I had a time, actually, I can recall, this was the ongoing, discussion about what should represent autistic. Should it be a puzzle piece? Should it be the infinity sign? Should it be a specific color? So I began to write and then I retracted, like literally had to post up. And what I like to do on my page is post questions. I like people to be engaged, to actually think and have the freedom and comfortability to actually retract to a question that I pose out there or even to my thoughts. That's the reason for my platform. It's not to offend anybody, but I had to retract what I was about to write. And then I asked Ben Hartraff, I said, how do you feel about the puzzle piece? How do you feel about the color red? What is your perspective on it? And he gave me a very good perspective, which just like, hey, everybody is different. If you want to have red as your signifying color, then you have red. I want blue. You would like the infinity sign? Have the infinity sign. I have the puzzle piece. At the end of the day, we're still together as a community. So that gave me perspective to go back in and give my thoughts from a parent perspective, but the grounds was community. And I feel the same way. Once again, my premise is based off of strongly off of my religion, which is based off of love. 
I don't care whatever you believe in. I love you as my brother and sister. That's what I'm a hold accountable to do. So that's where I made my post at and it was greeted openly and it was accepted by everybody. And I think just like Tom says, if it's not something that you don't want your kids to read 30, 20 years down the line, don't post it up. You know, you got to be mindful, especially if you're trying to be a public figure or if you're already in a public eye about other people's opinions. Does that change you as a person in your personal opinions? No, but you can have them and don't put them online because you don't know what type of ramifications that may have. So that was my personal like one saw incident just recently. And it, it to me, you know, and I, I'll just reinstate this. The autism community is such a loving, diverse, compact community that is growing, that has already grown, but is growing and growing. I am not allowing the world's issues to leak into this community and disrupt what we are building here to unfold onto the world. So I pose everybody sort of a, a checklist. You know, are you adding to the disruption to the community? Are you bringing hate, vengeance, envy? You know, are you bringing these into the community? Because if you are, then you need to remove yourself from the community. It's not welcome here. You know, my, my son is compassionate. He's, he's loving. He's, he's funny. He's engaging. And I would love for him to stay that way. And he will as long as he braced himself and then he embraced those just like him and then teach others outside the community to be just like him every single day. So that's my story right there. That's what I can uh, claim on as far as this uh, question. All right. And Jeff, you made some points in the chat. Would you like to elaborate on that about social media? Yes. And this is something that I recently started doing is limiting my time on social media because if you are on social media too much, you're going to be, you know, so keyed up and then you're going to start, you know, breaking other people's personal boundaries. You're going to be going French. You're going to go hunting for people that you've heard of, but they don't know you personally. It's happened to me. And then it's also not good for your mental health because if you are all, and if you're on social media way too much during the day, then your mental health is going to deteriorate and your life is going to be dictated by social media instead of the outside world. So it's just some, just something to keep in mind for the future. All right. We're running at the close to the end of our time here. So let me ask this question. What advice would you give to educators when teaching individuals about public safety? Put it at the forefront. I think we, we say safety first, but as I mentioned earlier, it's being left to chance. We think everything's going to turn out okay, that society will understand. I wouldn't say that's the best approach and that's not putting safety first. So I put the website in the chat earlier. I'll put it in there one more time. It's be safe, the movie.com. It's a movie. I think everyone on and off the spectrum needs to see to be safe in the community. And, and officers have told us, we wish everyone knew what was in this movie. Stay where you are. When you meet the police, keep your hands where they can be seen. Don't touch our stuff. Disclose your diagnosis. This is essential and it needs to be taught and safety needs to be part of IEP goals and other transition plans. I think that one of the things that like I recommend the most to educators is we need to put it in the forefront, but we also need to like include the parents and we need to include the people that are most likely to be with the student when they might get lost or when these situations might, might arise. And often we're like, I feel like in schools and in day-to-day -day life, we focus so much on the writing goals, the reading goals, the math goals, and all the other goals that we have that we forget to tell the parents, like you need to teach them about staying close to you. You need to teach them about what to do when he's lost. You need to teach them who the police officer is, teach him about privacy, teach him about communicating to strangers or not communicating to strangers. And a lot of the time when we don't include those essential people in their lives, all the things that we're teaching in session 
they're just not going to generalize. They're not going to be effective. They're not going to be functional. They're just going to stay there. So I think it's, it's about talking about it, talking to our kids about it, talking to the parents about it. So yeah, maybe being more open about safety. I think this goes into so many different directions and I've personally been speaking more about it and I've been asked to engage more about it, whether it be public speaking events that I'm doing or other panel discussions. The first one is that this is needed all across the board, all across the world. We need to be having these trainings. Most importantly, as my show focuses on men, you know, so-called men who wants to be leader of their household that dwells into the community as well. So I would love to see more men of autism kids or of awesome kids actually step up and be willing to educate officers, whether it be free of charge, whether they're getting paid something, whatever the case may be, but being able to educate officers about their child, because it, he may think in his mind, okay, well, it's never going to happen to my child because I'm keeping my child safe, but you never know. So I just want to see more men do that. The second point that I would like to make, and, and I'm the person who normally goes towards the elephant in the room, is the black and brown community. I represent that community. We are not speaking to law enforcement officers right now. It is a very, very big disparity in those communities. We are also lacking diagnosis of autism within our communities because we fear of another label being placed on our children. I am stepping forward as a representation of that community. I'm African-American to say, we need this to happen and we need it to happen now. So when I sit there and talk to police officers about my child and everyone else, that's exactly what I see. My child and everybody else's child out there. When I sit there and I put on my fire and I put on my fire helmet and my bunker uniform, I act as if my child or my family is in that building. We need to start doing that as men more and more and more. I guess you could say that's my core mission. You know, that's that's what I'm standing for is really for men to see what I'm doing, to say, hey, I can do that too. And for them to be better than me and pursue it on, sort of like a, a virus. I just wanted to, to spread and to spread. I don't care where you are in the world. We need this to continue and we need this to push forward. So I'm just open to talk to any police officer because I've been there, like I said, and, and you know what? I wish I had training that is being provided for today. I wish I would have met a father like myself now than what I was before when I was a corrections officer, because I think about so many of the inmates that came in that was labeled, you know, mentally challenged that might have actually been on the spectrum. And I ignored them because of what higher ups actually placed them in the system. You know, it's, it's bad. It's bad. So that's my two plus two cents, four cents in there. <laughs> Thanks, Jamil. And Rachel, any last thoughts? The question was, what advice would you give to educators when teaching individuals about public safety? That we need to talk more about it, especially in schools. And we need to help people recognize what to look for when they're out and about. And we need to recognize what to look for when we're talking to strangers so we don't get in the car with them. And start when people are really young. Yes, exactly. Thank you so much to our panelists and our audience members as well. I'll see everyone in the community. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. Safety in public involves more than just looking both ways when crossing the street and knowing which strangers are okay to speak with. Educating community members and police officers about how to interact with autistic people can save lives. Are you a self-advocate willing to share your experiences and educate others? Are you a professional seeking to hear directly from autistic voices and improve your practice? Are you a family member hoping to support and empower your loved one? Whatever your role related to autism is, you can join our global autism community online to connect and collaborate with people all over the world.
participate in important conversations on our platform, and join us at our next monthly roundtable discussion. Sign up today at community.globalautismproject.org. Let's work together to transform how the world relates to autism. Thanks for listening. Take care. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. You've been listening to Autism Knows No Borders, brought to you by the Global Autism Project. You can find Rachel's notes for this episode and learn more about today's guests at autismknowsnoborders.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please kindly rate the show and leave a review. By doing so, you'll be helping us increase awareness and acceptance of autism around the world. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.